Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming to this talk. My name is Gene Pang, and I'll be talking about accelerating Spark workloads in a Mesos environment with Alexio. So here's a little bit about myself uh, before we get started. Uh, my name is Gene Pang, and I'm a software engineer at Alexio. And I'm also a PMC member of the Alexio Open Source Project. Before I started at Alexio, I got my PhD from UC Berkeley from the AMP Lab, um, which also produced you know, software like Mesos. And before that, I was working at Google with distributed databases and systems. And here you can find my Twitter and GitHub handle. So here's a brief overview of what I'll be talking about today. I'll first go into an introduction and overview of Alexio, and then I will um, go into some use cases that so some, some users are using with uh, Alexio and, and Spark and Mesos together. And also, I will sort of describe how you can use Spark and Alexio together. Uh, and, then, and then I'll go into some, you know, how does this get deployed uh, in Mesos, and then finally go through a demo um, of this on, on DCOS. So first, uh, let's talk about sort of the, this, this big data ecosystem. You know, back in the day, say 10, 15 years ago, it was actually pretty simple, I, I would say. It, it, they, there, was, there was like basically one framework. There was the Hadoop framework where we had Hadoop MapReduce. We also had Hadoop HDFS for the storage. And it was actually very simple. Um, there was basically one, a one-to-one -one mapping. However, you know, as time evolved, the ecosystem evolved as well. And today, there are lots of different types of frameworks for computation, and there's lots of, there are a lot of different types of storage systems that people like to use. So for example here, you know, you know, HDFS is still here, but there are a lot of new ones that people, are, that people want to use, like the cloud storage, like S3, the Google one, uh, uh, Microsoft Azure, and then there's also lots of um, uh, storage appliances as well. So there's a lot of storage, and then there's also a lot of uh, computation application frameworks like HD, uh, like uh, Hadoop MapReduce, but there's also Spark, which is a big one. There's also Flink, Presto, uh, you name it. There's a lot of different types of application frameworks. And so this can actually get pretty messy just in terms of writing applications, managing the storage, and just adding new ones removing old ones just is, is, is quite difficult. Also, um, because uh, the, the compute and storage, there's just such a wide variety of them now, it's harder to get sort of the optimal I.O. performance from, uh, the app from the storage to the application. So this is where Alexio wants to help things. Alexio is a new layer in between storage and computation. And here you can see that it sits in between the application frameworks and, it's and, and above the storage systems. And it actually uh, abstracts away the storage systems and provides a single unified and global namespace across all the different storage systems. And so applications really only need to talk to just Alexio with just different paths, and they can access their different data uh, that happen to, be um, happen to be stored in separate storage systems. Uh, in addition to that, Alexio is actually a distributed system. So what um, typically this is deployed close to the computation, and what Alexio can do is actually cache and store data closer to the application, uh, also in memory. So what this allows is that it can actually enable in-memory access to data for applications. And this is actually very powerful. Applications really o only need to talk to one API, one namespace, and they can get almost local memory speed type of I.O. Uh, from their data, even though the data can be all over the place in different storage systems. And this ultimately enables decoupling, being able to decouple computation and storage. And that's actually very powerful. You can scale each independently, and, and it's actually a, a, very, a very scalable way to operate things. So with Alexio in the picture now, you know, the, the analytics, uh, it can power a lot of different types of analytics and a lot of different types of uh, ecosystems and scenarios. So we've seen examples of big data, IoT. Uh, we've seen AI, machine learning. So there's a lot of different uh, use cases that people use Alexio in. Also, you can deploy them in very uh, in in a, in a diverse 
uh, environment. So you can you can deploy them uh, on premise. You can deploy them on the cloud, across different clouds. And so we've actually seen, uh, you know, especially using Mesos, we've seen um, Alexia being deployed across clouds and, uh, and, and also on cloud on premise, uh, simply, um, you know, also using Mesos, simply by deploying these Alexio workers um, uh, to different locations. So there's, it's a very flexible way to, to operate. So, so just to sort of summarize what Alexio can provide, ultimately it can unify your data and it, it provides this one single API and single namespace for your data, uh, regardless of where the data actually lives uh, underneath it. Uh, there's also a lot of flexibility with Alexio. You can, since you get to decouple your computation and storage, you can scale them independently. You can use, you can mix and match different computation. You can mix and match different storage. And um, it's still, uh, Alexio allows you to do that and it enables that to make it much easier. And lastly, um, Alexio, since it can store data closer to the application and in memory, it can greatly improve the IO performance. So Alexio is, Alexio is an open source project, and it's actually one of the fastest growing ones. Uh, Alexio has, has been open source for about four years now, so uh, yeah, about four years. And this is actually a graph of the number of GitHub contributors uh, to the project over the first four years of, of the project. And um, the top line is Alexio, and this, this graph is actually a little bit stale, but if you, I think if you, if you go on a GitHub today, I think there's over 600 contributors um, in, in the Alexio project. So it's actually been really exciting, and and fun to be a part of that community and sort of see how um, different people are using Alexio in, in different ways. So next I'll talk about some Alexio, Spark, and Mesos use cases out there. Uh, so this first one uh, is, is from Chunar. They're um, you know, a big travel website uh, in, in, in China. And here uh, they have an interesting use case where they actually have multiple computation frameworks. They have Spark and Flink, and they want to do both streaming, they want to do both batch, and there's a lot of sort of mixing and matching between the two computation frameworks, but they also have multiple storage systems that they're storing data in. They have HDFS and they're also, also using Ceph. So there's you know, multiple computation and multiple storage. And it was actually, um, you know, becoming sort of a headache to manage all that, as well as they're not getting the best performance that they wanted. So they added Alexio um, in addition, so they added Mesos and they added Alexio to the picture. And by doing this, they could actually abstract away the, the different storage systems that they actually have, and they can get some of the higher performance I.O. that they were looking for, as well as being able to share a lot of that data between the two computation frameworks uh, through the memory. And so this actually sped up a lot of their, their jobs, and uh, especially in, in some really bad peak times, uh, some of their queries actually completed 300 times faster uh, with this new environment. So they actually found a lot of value from Alexio. This next uh, example is from Garden Health. And uh, they do a lot of genomics and cancer research, and uh, here they had um, a Spark, before they had the Spark HDFS environment, but uh, they, it wasn't um, scaling up as much as they could have. And they were looking for actually, they have a lot of data, and they want to, they need to scale up more. So they actually moved to something, uh, they moved to Minio, which is like a cloud, like an object store, uh, where they could scale out the data f uh, far greater than HDFS. And so once they did that, though, the data was actually, it was remote and slower. So they were, they wanted sort of the performance back from you know, when they had sort of the, the local data. So they added, um, you know, Alexio to the picture, uh, along with Mesos, to, the s to be able to scale out. And they, you know, ran Spark, Spark on Alexio uh, uh, over Minio, and that actually sped up a lot of the access as well as uh, be able to access even their HDFS data as well. So this, this sort of gave them the flexibility to, to use different storage underneath their application um, and be able to scale out to their needs. So next I'll talk about how Spark and Alexio uh, can be used. So one, one class of um, benefits that Alexio can provide is actually being able to share data uh, via the memory. And Alexio can enable that. Uh, so with, um, so if you were to just run so, uh, so Spark jobs uh, on Mesos on, on some storage, and if they wanted to cache their own data, they would actually be 
each of the Spark contexts will be caching their own data. And that uh, w essentially would duplicate the data that, that you have uh, in memory, and that could actually waste some space. So here we have an example where you know blo both blocks one and three are stored by these two Spark uh, computation contexts, but um, you know that's, that's somewhat unnecessary, especially if they're on the same machine. So if you have, if you use Alexio instead, um, you can actually store that data in Alexio, and Spark wouldn't have to store that data in internally. And so if Spark doesn't have to store that internally, the Alexio can essentially manage caching and storing that data in memory for the Spark applications, and they Spark can ha have direct access to that in-memory data um, and be able to not have to duplicate uh, duplicate the um, the the memory memory usage as well as have memory speed I/O to that data. Another um, so even if there's only one Spark context, uh, there's a lot of benefit as well, uh, since you can share that data across different um, invocations of that context. So here, so here we have the Spark context on, on uh, running on some data, but you know if for some reason that Spark context crashes or you know has to be restarted or another one gets restarted um, all that sort of useful data gets lost and you'd have to reread it so if you reread it from something that's slow th it would actually take a long time to to um, restart that spark job so instead you can store it in Alexio and even if um, the spark application has to restart or has or crashes the data is still resident in the memory uh, in the Alexio worker and so because of that, the application can, when it gets restarted, it can directly read from the memory, uh, f the data from memory, and thus uh, greatly inc increase the I/O performance there. So here is a high-level overview of what the Ar Alexio architecture looks like. Alexio essentially has three major components. There's the Alexio client, there's the Alexio master, and Alexio worker. So the Alexio client is living in the application, and that is what uh, the application uses to communicate with Alexio. And then there is the Alexio master and workers, which I'll speak more about in detail later, but th they do most of the interaction uh, with the storage, and the storage is over here on the, uh, on the right. And so th um, the applications only really need to talk to Alexio and Alexio workers, Alexio masters, and then the workers and masters will interact with the under the backing underlying storage uh, for the data and metadata. So the Alexio client is, is the main way that applications interact with Alexio, and there are actually a few different ways to interact with Alexio, uh, different APIs. So there's the there's the native Java Alexio file system client, which um, has a lot of the, the Alexio-specific operations, such as pinning and unpinning. There's mounting, unmounting, you know, setting TTL, things like that. Then there is the HDFS-compatible file system client, and this, is, this enables applications to not have to modify their code if they're already writing, reading and writing from HDFS. It'll look, Alexio will look just like an HDFS client, and thus um, it'll interact with Alexio while the application thinks it's ta talking to HDFS. And then also a new, a new API that was recently added uh, a, few, like a few weeks ago was the S3 API. So when applications are written talking to S3, um, Alexio can also you know, talk the S3 API, so applications can just point it to, to Alexio instead. So these are the three major ways that uh, you can use to interact with Alexio. There's also the Luxio master component, and this component is primarily used for managing the metadata. And there's there's two major, there's there's a few major uh, you know classes of metadata. There's the file system namespace metadata, which you know, handles all the file system namespace, and there's the metadata for all the blocks of the data, and as well as the workers in, in the system. So these are the main pieces of metadata that exist in the system, and the the, the, the primary master also writes to a journal, so all the actions are durable, and the secondary masters will essentially tail, tail that journal to, to keep up to date. And the workers, are the, they're the primary components uh, for storing the actual data. And so they, they store the data, they serve the data, they read the data, and they, also, they, they can store it actually in different storage media. 
there it's called the, the feature is called tiered storage, but essentially, uh, Alexio can um, can use hard drives, SSDs, and memory for storing this type of data, and there are sort of eviction policies and, and, and promotion policies built in that you can configure to get the, the, the type of behavior that you want. And also workers are the main components that read and write, uh, read and write the, the data to and from storage. So next, um, I'll briefly talk about uh, how Alexio can be deployed on Mesos. And uh, Alexio is uh, part of the DCOS uh, the universe. And so um, as you can see here, uh, over here, um, you can see Alexio is a package on the DCOS uh, um, universe. And you know, like, like I mentioned before, Alexio um, you know, can, can provide this unified view of the data that you have in different storage systems and also can give you um, higher performance I.O. to that data. And DCOS, DCOS actually makes, um, makes deployment very, very easy and scalable. And, and it's, just a, it's a very uh, useful tool in terms of um, dealing with the infrastructure. So together, it's actually really, really uh, convenient to, to have Alexio and DCO uh, implemented um, for DCOS so that uh, you can have uh, much faster deployments uh, for your applications, uh, as well as depo uh, deploying Alexio as well uh, in the same framework. And so this also enables um, being able to have uh, you know, applications in the DCOS, in the Mesos world, that want to access data sort of outside the, 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 Mesos, the Mesos world. And so Alexio can help bridge that gap and continue to provide high performance to that data. So next I'll show a short, uh, a short uh, video demo uh, on sort of how uh, it looks like uh, deploying Alexio on DCOS and, and a short demo with Spark. And so for this demo, this is a, it's a very simple setup. We have, s we have a, you know, Mesos, ru we have DCOS running, and we are going to install Spark and Mesos uh, together, and we'll be running a few simple Spark commands and being able to show how it interacts with Alexio. And uh, we also will be uh, interacting with some data uh, in Amazon S3. So in terms of the demo setup, we're using this, these, these versions of the software. And we're using an Amazon EC2 instance, uh, M3 X large uh, type of instance. So, uh, I in this in the setup, we have HDFS setup. And in HDFS, uh, this is the, the UI that shows the files in HDFS. And here you can see there's one file called uh, license. And so there's one file in HDFS. And then we also have um, an S3 bucket for this demo. And in, in this S3 bucket here, we're showing the listing of the bucket. And we have two files. We have uh, the readme file and um, a sample 1G file. And so these are the two storage systems that um, you know, we'll be interacting with today. And so um, if we go back to uh, the DCOS, we also have a Docker registry that will store um, you know, some of our Docker, Docker images for Spark and Alexio and things like that. And so to install Alexio, um, it's, it's, in, it's in the universe. And so you can look for Alexio. Uh, you can try it and you can install it through that. Um, so there are two main things you have to you have to uh, configure uh, for the installation. One is the license. Um, and so this, um, the license has to be so sort of base 64 encoded. Uh, and, and this is what this is doing right now. But it's going to base 64 encode uh, the license. And that'll be sort of pasted into the configuration. And then another thing that you'll have to um, configure is the UFS address. And this is something we call the under, under FS, under file system address. And this is where we are, are essentially mounting um, some store system to the root of Alexio. So uh, something needs, there needs to be some connection. Uh, Alexio needs to have some sort of something backing the, the file system. So here we're going to be um, using the HDFS location. Uh, we're using the HDFS that I showed earlier to be the under FS for Alexio, for the root of Alexio. 
And so once we've configured those two, two major points, we're going to install it. Um, yeah. And then once that's and once that starts, uh, you will be able to see a lot of the processes start up for Alexio uh, running on Mesos. And so here, I think we will be showing some some tasks here that are starting up. And some of the tasks that start up are the workers. Some of them are uh, the master. Um, and those are so yeah, those are the main the main components that that get start up, started up. And so once Alexio uh, looks like Alexio is started. Next, what we'll do is we'll actually log in to the master and then start doing a few commands with the Alexio um, shell commands. So since Alexio does provide a file system type um, of, 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 a, of a namespace and interface, uh, you can do simple um, file system-like uh, operations. So um, we'll log into the master. We'll you know start up. Um, we'll start up a Docker container. Yeah, I think we're just looking at some of the Alexio configuration here. And yeah, the first command we'll do is a basic ls command. And so uh, here, it's a little bit cut off, but it'll it's basically doing Alexio fs ls slash the root. And so here, you can see it's listing one file already. So we didn't do anything with Alexio yet, but there's already a file there. And that's because we mounted that HDFS I showed earlier into Alexio. And so since HDFS had that license file that I uh, showed earlier, uh, now we can see it uh, in Alexio. So when we did the LS, we can see the license file there. Also, uh, you can see that it says not in memory. That means it hasn't been loaded into Alexio yet. So it's still in HDFS. The metadata is in Alexio, but not uh, the data is not in Alexio yet. And so this next command here, we're actually going to mount another storage system into, th into the Alexio namespace. Since Alexio can combine different storage systems in the same namespace, this is what we're doing here. We're actually going to mount the S3 bucket I showed earlier into the namespace of Alexio. And so here, towards the end of the command, uh, we're mounting the DCOS demo S3 bucket into slash S3A. And so the path in Alexio will be slash S3A, and we're mounting that S3 bucket in. And so now, if we uh, list that location in Alexio slash S3A, what we'll see, we will see actually see those two files that I showed earlier. And so here, you can see two files, S3A. Th you can see the readme file and the sample file that um, was already existing in the S3A bucket. And so the metadata has been pulled into Alexio, but it, the data, the contents of the data, has a uh, has not been pulled in yet, since nothing has read that data yet. And so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to uh, start up a, a, a Spark shell and do a few commands with Spark on top of running on top of Alexio. So here we're, we're logging in. We're going to start a Docker container. And so, um, as yeah, so we're starting a sh uh, Spark shell, so it'll start up the executors, and we are going to run basically a simple command that will count the data uh, in that S3 bucket, in, in that sample 1G file. And so first, what we're going to do is we're going to set the log level to info so we can see some of the timing information. So that's what uh, we'll be doing here. And then what we're going to do is we're going to read the sample 1G file from Alexio. So here, uh, you can see the command. It, we're recreating an RDD from the sample 1G file of Alexio. So the path that we're passing in here is it starts with Alexio. It's the Alexio scheme. And then we have uh, you know the, the, the host name and things like that. And then we have the path um, S3A sample, sample 1G. And so that's the file that we're creating this RD RDD from. And then we want to essentially read that RDD. And so we're going to do a simple count on that. And so 
it'll it'll process that data. And actually, at this point, it'll read it in from S3 since it hasn't been read in before yet. So if you take a look at the time, it took um, about 30 seconds to read all that data in, to read all, uh, read all that data in. And in that process, actually, it will um, have lo it, will, it will have uh, saved it in a Luxio space as well. So if we if you look up here, um, we do the same listing on the S3A path in Alexio, and now the sample 1G file um, says in memory. And that's because since an application has read that file, it, it pulled it in from S3 and stored it in Alexio now. And so the next time that you want to read it, it'll actually be in memory now. So we're actually going to start a new Spark shell, a separate Spark shell, um, and we're going to run sort of the same command. We're going to you know, create an RDD, RDD from that Alexio file, and we're going we're going to read that data. So we set the log level, we you know create that RDD, the same RDD uh, from the same file, and then we're going to run the count. And so here um, you can notice that uh, there's there's a, a node local locality level for these tasks, and that's because it's now loaded into Alexio. So Spark can actually find it. It can schedule tasks local to uh, the data, and it's actually in-memory data in, in this case. And so it'll actually greatly speed up uh, the processing. So if you take a look at the time now, it took about three and a half seconds. So you know, almost 10 times uh, you know, f faster um, to read that data again and to process it, that data again because it was, um, it was read from the Alexio memory. So that is the end of the demo. So here are just some of the results from the simple demo. Uh, we have, uh, this is sort of the, the duration in seconds of that, of that processing, that, that RDD count. And with Alexio, this, so the light blue, the top lines of each section is the first time you ran the count, and the second line is the second time you ran the count. And you know, if you run directly on S3, it'll actually, which is the bottom two lines here, it will take the same amount of time to read the data again because you're just going to access uh, S3 again. But with Alexio, the second time you, the second time you read it, uh, it'll actually read it from Alexio memory. It's already, it's already been cached in Alexio. So it actually uh, will have much faster I.O. because it's already in memory. And so the application uh, you know, will essentially be, eight, so in this example, eight times faster because the data is already uh, in Alexio. So in conclusion, uh, I showed how easy it is to use Alexio and, and Spark uh, on the Mes in the Mesos environment. I also described sort of the overview of Alexio and how it can benefit a lot of different scenarios. Um, Alexio can also provide uh, a lot of I/O performance because we can mm -hmm. store mm -hmm. Alexio can Alexio can store data closer to the application and in memory. And I've also shown that Alexio can connect different store systems easily into a single unified namespace. So that is the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Hello. Thanks for the presentation. It was really cool. Um, just a question. So if I understand correctly, Alexio is like distributed memory transaction or distributed memory across multiple machines and it reads the data from the memory on different machines, right? Yes, you can, uh, you can read memory from other machines. Yes. From different machines. Like yes. the cache basically in the memory is actually multiple machines and they do distributed memory. So what about cache invalidations and consistency? Okay. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, primarily, Alexio works in the, in the environment where the data is immutable. So if when the data is immutable, that is no, uh, no longer an issue. So uh, once you write a file in Alexio, you'd have to delete it if you wanted to update it. Oh, okay. Thank you. Hi. Uh, it's a little bit of a similar question. So if I have um, a, a data set that's larger than any one of my um, uh, servers can hold itself, um, and it needs to be striped across multiple servers, how does Alexio deal with failure modes? So if I have, I don't know, say a terabyte of data, 
and I lose a node in my cluster with a part of that data? Will I, re will I pull in just that part, or will I have to pull in the entire data set again? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, in, in the Luxio world, there's a concept of um, files and blocks. And so uh, Luxio will have to reread blocks of data, but not the entire file. So if the file has like 10 blocks and you lose a machine that had two of those blocks, you would have to reread uh, two of those blocks from the underlying store. Or from if it's on a different machine, it, it can even read it from an another Luxio machine. So um, it's, it's on a block level. Uh, one more question. Um, so you mentioned about Spark locality, data locality. And um, so I'm confused in this case. So the data is on Oluxio, and we have, like, there will be Spark workers running, but they are actually, d they might be different machines. So, right? Um, like, uh, the Spark jobs are running maybe on different nodes than Oluxio nodes. Where it ca yeah, that's that's possible. Yeah, and then in this case, what locality means? To, to yeah, so if they're, if, they're, if they're not on the same machine, then you can't get locality. I, if 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 the Spark workers are on the same machine as the, the Luxio workers, then that's when you get locality. Okay, but like even if like let's say if we have one Spark node and two Oluxio nodes, and the data is sharded between the memory is in between uh, two of these two nodes. Then the look. Then uh, the Spark worker will see uh, local data because it it knows one node, but actually the other half of the data is on another node, right? Yes. So, that so if yeah, if you only had one Spark worker, then um, for ha like half of those jobs, th it will not be local data because it'll be on a different machine. Right. Okay. Thank you. Hi. I have been reaching you since you are Tachyon before uh, Alexia. <laughs> we were Tachyon before, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I have always the uh, one question. I read about uh, Cache in Office of Heap mode that is reading for Tachyon. When was Tachyon, I think uh, Luxio has it. But they never uh, ended to understand why we want to catch a, a RDD if we, want, if we could save in Alexia. It's not the same? or. I don't know if I are, are, you are you talking about caching, Spark caching versus yes. Uh, yes. Aluxio? Caching in in a, in a memory level that is not yeah. a memory only is of heap. That I think is only re only relate with with Aluxio if I understand. Well, so Spark has many different levels of caching. One of them is like the memory caching layer uh, level. Um, so that is that's not Aluxio, but. Um, I guess there's a few distinctions here, but one of the major ones is that uh, that when Spark caches that when Spark caches itself in, in its own internal memory, it sort of lives for that one Spark context or Spark job. So a if you store it in a if you store it in that one Spark context, another Spark context cannot read that data um, uh, because it's in a different context. So if you have it in a Luxio, uh, both or any c Spark context can actually read that data from memory. Actually, it doesn't even have to be Spark. It could be like Flink or, or, or whatever. So on, on any application can read it from memory. So it's just essentially you're pulling some of the caching duties out of Spark and into some external, external uh, system. And another question. Uh, do, you s do you say that you have uh, several uh, file system from the underlying file system supported? Uh, how can you say how much, or I only see Gluster and HDFS. Uh, well, there's more? HDFS. There's a uh, there's you know there's Gluster ones because I think that's also talks to HDFS. There's S3. Um, uh, there is like NFS type of systems as well. Um, yeah, so a lot of different. I think we support many of the files. Is there some? Is there one that you're particularly interested in? In my case, it was NFS, so yes. You yeah, so I, I think we do have people using it with NFS as well. Okay, thanks. Any more questions? Thank you.